Imagine diving into an ocean where monsters bigger than buses lurk in the depths. We're about to uncover some of the most terrifying sea creatures that ever existed. Think the T-Rex was scary? Wait until you meet a sea monster with a shark-like tail and jaws that could swallow a shark whole. And that's just the beginning. Picture a crocodile-fish hybrid with suction-like jaws, a king of sharks with teeth the size of human hands and a bone-crushing bite, plus a gigantic sea turtle with a 15-foot wingspan that ruled the ancient oceans. Ready to face your fears and explore these ancient underwater nightmares? Let's dive right in. Today we are looking into one of the prehistoric sea's scariest predators, a super crocodile. Wait, fish? No, dinosaur. Uh, whatever. I'll just let you decide for yourself once you're done watching this video. For now, just know that it was twice the size of Shaq. Duckasaurus were fearsome predators that lived during the late Jurassic period, around 152 to 157 million years ago. These prehistoric reptiles were members of the family Metriorhynchidae. Now this family was made up of marine crocodilomorphs that were complete water babies and never left the ocean. While it wasn't nearly as well known as some marine reptiles of the time, like plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, Duckasaurus was a pretty scary freaking predator in its own right. With that streamlined body and powerful flippers, it could easily swim through the water and devour huge prey like sharks in one go. So far, we've found two Duckasaurus species. Duckasaurus maximus, living out in the seas covering Europe during the late Jurassic, and Duckasaurus andionesis, who lived in what's now Argentina during the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous. Oh, and there might be a third Duckasaurus species in Mexico from the late Jurassic, some other Metrioninchus used to be thought of as Duckasaurus species, but now they've got their own names, Plesiosuchus and Torvanistus. So what did the Duckasaurus look like? Well, this might freak you out a little bit, but bear with me. Imagine a creature that looks like a mix between a crocodile and a fish. At first glance, it might seem like a crocodile, but take a closer look and you'll notice its shark-like tail fluke and flippers. That's Duckasaurus a unique crocodiliomorph with serrated teeth, and it was most definitely a reptile that loved the open ocean. Honestly, it's a pretty fascinating combo of traits. Even though Dacosaurus is part of the crocodiliomorph family, it looks more like a fish than a typical crocodile, but it does share some similarities with modern crocodiles. For one, they both have big skulls and long bodies. But Dacosaurus has a shorter, taller snout, serrated teeth, and a slightly different body shape compared to your regular crocodile. These features make it stand out among other marine reptiles, which usually have long snouts and sharp teeth for catching fish. But if you want to know what really makes it stand out from its modern crocodile cousins, this one's it. Instead of regular limbs, Duckasaurus evolved flippers, turning them into speedy swimmers. They had tall dorsal fins and fluke tails, both working together to propel these amazing creatures through the water. But that's not all that's different. While your typical crocodile has tough, armored skin with thick scales, Duckasaurus had the smooth and scaleless look. Yes, they were pretty sleek. In terms of size, Duckasaurus was no small fry. Estimates put it at 4 to 5 meters, 13 to 16.4 feet in length, which is twice the size of not just Shaq, but also Andre the Giant. It weighed in at around 200 to 275 kilograms, 441 to 606 pounds. Pretty darn hefty, innit? But if we check out other members of Dacosaurus's gang, the Geosaurini, we find that it wasn't the only big marine crocodile swimming in the late Jurassic waters. In fact, it seems like there was a bit of a size trend going on between them. Take Torvanistus, for example, it's about the same size as Duckasaurus, measuring 4 to 4.7 meters, 13 to 15.4 feet in length, and tipping the scales at 275 kilograms, 606 pounds. But it had a longer snout and smaller teeth compared to Duckasaurus. Then there's Tyrannonistus, keeping it in the family with a length of roughly 4 to 5 meters, 15 to 16.5 feet. It's like the sibling that's right there in size. Not too big, not too small. And finally, the smallest one among them is Geosaurus, measuring just 2.5 to 3 meters, 8.2 to 9.8 feet long, 
and weighing in at 80 kilograms, 176 pounds. While crocodiles today are mostly semi-aquatic, living in freshwater environments like wetlands and rivers, some do venture into brackish or saltwater. Dacosaurus, however, was a different story. It likely embraced a fully aquatic lifestyle, navigating the ancient seas with its flipper-like limbs and shark-like tail fluke. Scientists believe it couldn't move on land at all, which meant it likely spent its entire life submerged. Apart from that, crocodiles have sharp teeth for piercing and holding prey, but Dacosaurus had a different set, lateriomedally compressed serrated teeth. This tooth structure efficiently cut through large prey, letting Dacosaurus easily tear flesh, unlike crocodilians that use a death roll. Interestingly, this tearing lizard had the largest but fewest teeth among metriorhynchids. But then again, that's typical of a species adapted to regularly prey on large animals. Research has revealed that Dacosaurus may actually have been the world's first suction predator. It probably had a jaw mechanism creating pressure inside that literally sucked prey in whole. This unique combination of features led scientists to nickname Dacosaurus a mix of killer whale and Tyrannosaurus. Now, what was on the menu for this incredible creature? The answer is sharks, and lots of them. Another thing about Dacosaurus is that they had skull chambers that looked like extra nostrils, but they were far from being that. These chambers actually housed salt glands, responsible for secreting excess salt. For Dacosaurus, living entirely in salt water, these salt glands were crucial for its survival. Now, modern crocodiles also have salt glands, but theirs are smaller and located on their tongues. However, it's doubtful that Dacosaurus and crocodiles inherited their salt glands from a common ancestor, mainly because the first members of their groups lived in freshwater. In fact, it's a bit of a mystery whether Metriorhynchids and their branch of Crocodylomorpha, Thalatosuchia, share a semi-aquatic ancestor with crocodiles. They might have independently evolved their love for water and some crocodilian-like traits separate from the terrestrial Crocodylomorph lineage. What do you think? Man, we've got to talk about their skulls next. These guys had a unique skull compared to other Metriorhynchids. While most had long, low skulls for quick underwater movement, Dacosaurus had a shorter, wider, and taller skull, giving it a dinosaur-like appearance, especially in Dacosaurus andienensis, which is actually nicknamed Godzilla. However, the skull of Dacosaurus maximus was in between Dacosaurus andienensis and typical Metrioninchids. This deep skull allowed for a powerful bite but created more drag, explaining its rarity among marine predators. Now, the life cycle of fully aquatic reptiles like Dacosaurus is pretty hard to crack. And here's why I say that. Typically, reptiles reproduce sexually by laying eggs, a process that involves leaving the water. So, how did they reproduce? Well, scientists think Dacosaurus might have evolved to be viviparous, meaning it gave birth to live babies. They compare it to ichthyosaurs, which also gave live birth. Another reptile, Kaikosaurus, might have been oviviparous, where the eggs formed inside until ready to hatch. But Dacosaurus probably didn't lay eggs on land. Fossils show a pregnant Dacosaurus mom giving birth to a baby with small paddle-like limbs, just like adults. This strongly suggests live birth. No nesting sites for Dacosaurus have been found, supporting the idea that they gave birth to live young. Still, we're not sure how long they were pregnant, how fast the babies grew, or if the parents took care of them, so there's a lot left to discover. But for now, let's talk about the things we do know, like their interactions with other species. When it comes to the aquatic world, the competition and prey of the formidable Dacosaurus depended on the specific sea in question. The paleofauna in Europe differed from that in South America. In Europe, Dacosaurus likely shared its aquatic home with fellow predators, such as Geosaurus giganteus, Cricosaurus suvicus, and Rachiosaurus gracilis. The survival strategy for this diverse group of predators was niche partitioning, where each species evolved to utilize its environment in a way that allowed coexistence and prevented the extinction of competing species. For instance, Cricosaurus suvicus and Rachiosaurus gracilis with their elongated snouts, were likely specialized in feeding on fish. Rachiosaurus might have targeted smaller fish, while Cricosaurus suvicus could have been a more versatile feeder. 
On the other hand, Steniosaurus, another crocodile form in the mix, might have been a slower swimmer, relying on ambushing prey. This niche partitioning extended to the two top predators, Dacosaurus and Geosaurus. Their teeth revealed different capturing techniques and probably different prey preferences. Dacosaurus had large, serrated teeth, while Geosaurus had blade-like teeth. The exact prey these predators went after remains unknown, but the European shallow seas were teeming with fish and marine creatures. Fossil evidence from the Vaca Muerta formation in South America, particularly in Argentina, also points to niche partitioning. Cricosaurus and Geosaurus fossils were found, indicating a similar coexistence strategy. Another South American metrioninchid, Puranosaurus, adds to the mix, although its ecological niche remains poorly studied. Argentinian waters were likely rich in ichthyosaurs, pterosaurs, and reptiles. Interestingly, Dacosaurus is often depicted in pursuit of an ichthyosaur called Capulosaurus, suggesting it might have been one of its potential prey items. Now, brace yourself if you're a rookie, because this discussion's about to get a little technical and overwhelming. This is how the Dacosaurus evolved. So this guy is classified as a Metrioninchid Thalatosuchian, right? And Thalatosuchians likely originated in the early Jurassic, with the earliest known remains dating back to the Sinumerian stage discovered in Chile and France. However, the officially recognized earliest members of the Thalatosuchia suborder are Ternosuchus reptiles from the Pleensbachian stage of the early Jurassic. Ternosuchus already had somewhat elongated jaws, and its successor's jaws became even more elongated, with some characteristics considered ancestral traits of the Teleosauridae and Metrioninchidae groups. Despite these insights, the evolution of Metrioninchid crocodilians is poorly understood due to limited studies, taxonomic challenges, and a lack of complete skeletons. However, it is confirmed that the evolution of Metrioninchidae led to highly diverse reptiles in terms of form, biodiversity, and function, likely reaching its peak before the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. Turning to the history of Dacosaurus's discovery, the journey takes us back to the 19th century in Germany, where the first fossils were initially thought to belong to Megalosaurus, a theropod dinosaur. Later, they were named Geosaurus maximus, before being attributed to the new genus Dacosaurus. In 1871, additional fossils were mistakenly linked to Megalosaurus, and named Megalosaurus skenathemi by Emanuel Bunzel. These fossils are now believed to be from a Dacosaurus maximus specimen. The second species, Dacosaurus andianensis, was discovered a century later in Argentina's Vaca Muerta formation. Two skulls from this species revealed a distinctive short and tall snout compared to other metrioninchids. Now, Dacosaurus and its relatives had an interesting metabolism. The first crocodilomorphs were like mammals and dinosaurs, producing their own body heat, endothermic. However, most Thalatolutians, including crocodilians, were ectothermic, relying on external sources for heat. Surprisingly, analysis of metrioninchid fossils suggest they had higher and more stable body temperatures, indicating potential endothermy. This allowed Dacosaurus to be more active than crocodilians and other ectothermic thalatosians. Although metrioninchid metabolisms were lower than plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, their higher metabolism might explain their survival into the Cretaceous period. As global oceanic temperatures fell at the end of the Jurassic period, ectothermic teleosaurs declined. Dacosaurus, with its higher body temperatures, may have been less vulnerable to climate change. Although we're not sure yet, there's speculation that Cretaceous metrioninchidae, like Dacosaurus and Dionysus, may have evolved even higher metabolisms. So how did they go extinct? Well, the sea crocs, including Dacosaurus, vanished before the end of the early Cretaceous. Since then, other crocodilomorphs have adapted to marine life, but none have embraced the ocean as much as Dacosaurus and its relatives, especially with their unique marine adaptations. The legacy of the real Godzilla lives on, not in crocodiles, but in the mammalian orcas. These marine creatures have taken up the role that Dacosaurus and its relatives once held in the ancient seas. To wrap it up, Dacosaurus, found in Europe and South America, lived for about 20 million years, spanning from the late Jurassic to the early Cretaceous. Despite its crocodilomorph classification, 
Dacosaurus was pretty freaking different from modern crocodiles. While its body may seem somewhat like a crocodile at first glance, its unique features discussed earlier set it apart. The snout was shorter and taller, its limbs were actually flippers, and the tail resembled that of a shark. Unlike present-day crocodiles, Dacosaurus had a scaleless body and likely spent its life as a fully pelagic reptile, adapted to an ocean. This is the tail of a shark twice the size of the most ferocious dinosaur known to mankind. Yes, the T-Rex. With five rows of 250 teeth, each the size of a banana, this gigantic shark would have been the nightmare of humans and beasts alike. Its jaws were strong enough to crush cars and big enough to swallow multiple humans in a single bite. That was the Megalodon, and its name literally meant giant tooth. But there was a lot more to this behemoth than just giant teeth. Megalodon was not only the biggest shark to ever exist, but it was also one of the largest fish in the history of the world. And to top it all off, it also has the strongest bite force of any animal in history. Let's start off with its physical appearance. Now, the Megalodon is classified as a mackerel shark, so it's possible that the Meg's shape and general form would have been similar to that of typical sharks we see today. In terms of its physical appearance, the Megalodon has been compared to different shark species, including the Great White Shark, the Basking Shark, the Whale Shark, and the Sand Tiger Shark. Whether or not it actually resembled these sharks, we'll never know. But based on comparisons, it's thought that the Megalodon had a streamlined and elongated body tapering towards the tail, and was equipped with powerful fins to propel it through the water. Its jaws may have been blunter and wider compared to that of the Great White, but the fins were probably similar in shape. On the other hand, if the Megalodon was more similar to the Basking Shark or Whale Shark, it means it would have had a crescent-shaped tail fin paired with a small anal and a second dorsal fin. But the most controversial aspect of the Megalodon's appearance is its size. Cause sharks are made up of cartilage, and cartilage does not fossilize. So all we have on the Megalodon are fragmentary jaw bones and tooth fossils. Based on these fossils and a few fossilized vertebrae, the maximum total length of this magnificent creature was calculated to be between 47 to 67 feet or 14.2 to 20.3 meters. That's bigger than even the largest T-Rex. The average length though was found to be around 34 feet or 10.5 meters. However, this is the estimate when comparing it to a great white shark, which isn't exactly correct. Research on an incomplete set of Megalodon vertebrae showed that it couldn't possibly have supported the body shape of a great white. The combined length of the vertebrae turned out to be less than the estimated total length of the Megalodon, which couldn't be possible. That's because the original estimates were made by comparing it to the broad, bulky body of a great white shark. Now we've realized that Megalodons would have actually been better suited for a longer, more slender body. So yeah, the Megalodon could have been even bigger than our current estimates. But until we get more fossils, these are the numbers we're going to go with. And based on these estimates, the Megalodon would have been about the same size or slightly bigger than the whale shark, which is the longest shark today, at about 62 feet or 18.8 meters for the biggest individual. However, you'll see in a while that this was the only similarity between the two. While the whale shark is a peaceful filter feeder, the megalodon is the exact opposite. Still, one difference for now is weight, because megalodon was unrivaled in that category. A 56-foot or 17-meter megalodon would have weighed about 130,000 pounds or 59 tons, which is more than twice the size of the biggest whale shark today and the biggest individual could have easily maxed out at about 250,000 pounds or 114 tons. This means that not only was Megalodon the biggest shark to have ever lived, but it also exceeded any of the biggest predators to have ever walked the planet or inhabited Earth's prehistoric seas. It was larger than the Spinosaurus, the T-Rex, or any massive theropod dinosaurs alive during the Mesozoic era. The Megalodon also exceeded some of the biggest marine reptiles discovered so far, including the Basilosaurus and Tylosaurus. You might be wondering why it grew to such huge sizes in the first place, 
that'll all become clear when you see the giants it had to compete with. So stay tuned till the end to see them for yourself. For now, its size tells us at least one thing. A creature this big would have taken over the whole planet, and not surprisingly, it actually did. Megalodon had a very wide geographic range during its existence. Fossils of the Megalodon have been recovered from every continent except Antarctica, meaning it had a global distribution. However, it is more commonly found in tropical and subtropical climates. In fact, scientists have been able to determine the likely conditions of this shark's habitat by studying its tooth fossils. Based on this, it has been determined that the Megalodon lived in waters within a temperature range of about 35 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1 to 24 degrees Celsius. That could only be possible if the Megalodon was warm-blooded. Yes, unlike most sharks and even most fish, Megalodon could control its temperature internally and not depend on the environment. Plus, it exhibited mesothermy, which is the ability to keep its body temperature higher than its surroundings by conserving metabolic heat. Because of this, the Megalodon would have been able to endure and survive in low temperature conditions. As a result, Megalodon was able to thrive in a wide range of habitats. This includes shallow coastal environments, swampy lagoons, continental shelves, and deep offshore areas. But just because it survived everywhere does not mean the environment had no effect on it. Fossils of the Megalodon discovered so far show that the average body size of the shark varied from one region to the other. Generally, specimens discovered in the southern hemisphere tend to be larger on average compared to those found in the northern hemisphere. The average length of the Megalodon specimens discovered in the northern hemisphere is about 31 feet or 9.6 meters, while those from the southern hemisphere were about 38 feet or 11.6 meters long. A similar variation is seen for individuals that lived in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The Pacific Megalodons were bigger, with an average length of about 36 feet, 10.9 meters, compared to 31 feet or 9.5 meters for the Atlantic Megs. Whatever the size though, one thing is clear. Megalodon ruled wherever it went, and that's obvious from its 20 million year long reign. Megalodon lived during the Cenozoic era from the early Miocene to the Pliocene epochs, approximately 23 to 3.6 million years ago. And the climate for this time couldn't have been better for this gigantic shark, since it was generally warmer than it is today, with fluctuating temperatures from time to time. But while the Earth experienced a relatively warm climate during the early Miocene, it gradually cooled during the late Miocene and into the Pliocene, these temperature changes probably affected the distribution and abundance of various marine species, including the Megalodon and the animals it preyed on. In fact, it could have influenced the Megalodon so much that it probably became the cause of its extinction, but more on that later. For now, let's focus on the time it did enjoy terrorizing the oceans, because almost no marine animal was safe from the Meg. This is simply because Megalodon was a very highly specialized and efficient predator, and the credit goes to its natural body structure. This shark had a streamlined body with a large and muscular tail, suggesting that it was an active swimmer capable of cruising through the water with great speed and agility. In fact, scientists have been able to estimate a top speed for Megalodon based on its proposed body proportions and comparison to other living shark species. A cruising speed of about 3.1 miles or 5 kilometers per hour has been proposed for the Megalodon. This is equivalent to a mean speed of about 0.09 body lengths per second for a 52 foot or 16 meter long Megalodon. At this pace, it moves similar to a sloth climbing through the trees. Now this may not seem like a big deal, but the cruising speed in body lengths would have been greater than that of any living mackerel shark. It's actually quite simple. If you look at a great white shark, it's only 13 feet or 4 meters long on average, and its cruising speed is 5 miles per hour or 8 kilometers per hour. In contrast, the Megalodon, which is almost 5 times bigger, has a slightly less speed of 3.1 miles per hour or 5 kilometers per hour. So the Megalodon was obviously a much better swimmer, even 20 million years ago. That could also be why it's thought to be a solitary hunter, because let's be honest, if two Megalodons started hunting together, they'd wipe the ocean in no time. And you don't have to take my word for it. 
Research published in August 2022 estimated the megalodon would have been able to devour prey the size of orca whales, which could be up to 26 feet or 8 meters long and weigh more than 8,000 pounds or 3 tons in just 5 bites. So it's safe to say megalodon was not just an apex predator, but the king of apex predators. Its diet was probably made up of fish, baleen whales, toothed whales such as ancestral forms of modern sperm whales, dolphins, killer whales, sirenians such as dugongs and manatees, and seals. Seals and dolphins might make sense, but how could it possibly take on whales? Well, its massive teeth, shaped like broad triangles with serrated edges, were perfectly adapted for grasping and tearing apart large prey. Plus, the megalodon's jaws were also huge, just like the rest of its body. In fact, they were so massive that they could swallow two adult humans standing side by side. In addition to being massive, the jaws were lined with up to 276 banana-sized teeth, each of which measured about 7.1 inches or 18 centimeters diagonally. So they were more knives than teeth. And luckily, we don't have to guess the kind of damage they could have done. In 2008, a group of scientists conducted an experiment to measure the bite force of an 8-foot, 2.5-meter long great white shark. They then used these measurements to estimate the bite force of a megalodon by scaling the results to match its maximum size and conservative minimum and maximum body mass. They estimated that a megalodon's bite force ranged between 100,000 to 180,000 newtons. In comparison, a modern great white shark has a bite force 10 times less than that, around only 18,000 newtons. And if these estimates are accurate, the megalodon may have had the most powerful bite of any animal ever. Not even large carnivorous dinosaurs like the T-Rex or gigantic prehistoric crocodiles could have come close to this kind of bite. But natural advantages were not the only weapon in its arsenal. You could say the megalodon was a born hunter, considering its highly effective attacking strategies. Unlike great white sharks that tend to attack prey by targeting the underbelly, megalodon likely attacked large prey from the side, delivering a fatal and final bite to the heart and lung area. The shark's teeth were strong enough to bite through tough skin and bones and could inflict a fatal blow on even the biggest prey. And yes, we have actual proof of this. Fossils of large baleen whales from the Miocene epoch have been found with huge bite marks on the rib cages like this, and it doesn't take a genius to know which animal it could have come from. And based on multiple other similar fossils with bite marks on different parts, it's thought that megalodons probably adapted their attack patterns based on the specific size of the prey they hunted. For instance, they probably rammed smaller whales with their blunt snout, disorienting them from delivering a fatal bite, while they killed sperm whales with a single bite to the head. It's also likely that the megalodon immobilized larger prey by biting off parts of their flipper and tails before killing and feeding on them. Still, there were a few animals that wouldn't have gone down so easily in front of this behemoth. Think about it. Megalodon couldn't possibly have been the only behemoth in its habitat, especially considering everything was gigantic in the prehistoric era. The seals, dolphins, sea turtles, and sirenians in its ecosystem were certainly easy prey for this mammoth shark. But baleen whales like the 22-foot or 6.8-meter Cetotherium and sperm whales like the 20-foot or 6-meter Orlophyceter would have been easy targets. Then, there are also animals that would have fought back. These include the humongous macroreptorials of the time, which were carnivorous whales that ate just about anything in their sight, including other whales. The 23-foot-long or 7-meter Brygomyphesita shigensis was one of the smaller ones among these macroraptorials. The largest out of all macroraptorials, Leviathan, would have been every animal's nightmare. Some of the whales from this genus grew to a maximum length of about 57 feet or 17 meters, had the largest biting teeth of any known animal longer than one foot, and targeted the same prey species as the megalodon. However, the massive size of the megalodon would have given it an edge over these predators. So while it may have fought these animals for prey or defense, it's certain that adult megalodons did not become prey for any animal in history. The young megalodons, though, would have had a harder time 
since it's thought that they were likely preyed on by other large predatory sharks, like great hammerhead sharks, which existed in the same time period and regions. As for adult megalodons, the only animals to take on them head to head were other megalodons. Yes, these sharks, like modern sharks, may have competed against each other and also may have exhibited cannibalism, with larger individuals preying on smaller ones. This would have been especially true for young megalodons way before they started swimming in open waters. See, unlike many fish that simply lay eggs, lamniform sharks like the megalodon have a different reproductive method. Their eggs hatch inside the mother's body and the young sharks stay there until they're big enough to survive on their own. During the prenatal growth period, the baby sharks need to eat to grow. The only problem is that everything looks like food to them, including their own siblings. So instead of finding food outside, they eat the eggs inside their mother's body. If their siblings hatch before them, they eat their siblings too. Sharks are known for being ferocious eaters, and baby sharks are no different. We don't have any direct evidence from fossils to prove that baby megalodons behaved this way, but it's likely they did. The massive size of adult megalodons supports this idea. This enormous size was probably both a cause and an effect of the evolutionary pressures in the prehistoric ocean ecosystem. Given their size, each embryo would have needed significant space and resources to thrive, and cannibalizing other embryos would have given them more room to grow. So, it seems like these beasts were literally willing to do anything to survive. But if they were willing to go to such extreme measures, how on earth did they go extinct? Around 2.6 million years ago, the megalodon disappeared, and there are a few possible reasons for this extinction. This period marked the beginning of the Pleistocene, also known as the Ice Age, characterized by cooler temperatures and long periods of glaciation. These climate changes could have directly affected the megalodon or impacted its food sources. The shift in climate led to a restructuring of whale habitats. As the environment changed, more productive areas with abundant food formed closer to the poles, making whales more migratory and spending more time in these colder regions. This could have posed a problem for megalodon if its prey moved to waters too cold for the shark to follow. For a long time, scientists believed this change in whale behavior might have contributed to the extinction of the world's biggest shark. But as you already know, megalodons were mesothermic and could survive at even an extreme temperature of 34 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius. So if changes in whale movements and habitats weren't the primary problem for megalodon, then what was? Well, the timing of Megalodon's disappearance coincides with two significant changes in the animal kingdom. One was the emergence of new predators that it had to compete with. Around the middle of the Miocene, the biggest Liviatan species, Liviatan milvelle, appeared. And if you're a Moby Dick fan and wondering where you've heard the name before, it's literally the same deadly whale from the novel. Liviatan had short, powerful jaws and big, strong teeth designed for biting into flesh. At 57 feet long, or 17 meters, this whale wasn't just eating squid, it was preying on other whales. And Liviatan was just one among many carnivorous whale species during the Middle Miocene. In the Late Miocene, another competitor appeared in the fossil record, the earliest ancestor of the great white shark, Carcharodon habeli. This shark was a direct competitor to the Megalodon as evidenced by tooth marks found on fossils of the same whale species that the megalodon ate, such as the small whale Piscobelina. A few million years later, in the early Pliocene, the first fossils of the modern great white shark, Carcharodon cacarius, emerged. Megalodon now had to compete with these newer, more agile sharks. At the same time, some of the megalodon's most important prey, particularly whales, were in decline. By the end of the Pliocene, the number of whale species decreased dramatically from about 60 to 40. Many of these whales were filter feeders that relied on krill, which in turn fed on microscopic algae called diatoms. Around 3 million years ago, there was a significant drop in diatom diversity in the oceans. In simple words, fewer diatoms led to fewer krill, resulting in fewer whales. With less food available, Megalodon had to compete even more fiercely with the smaller, faster great white shark. Being larger is advantageous when it provides access to a different food group, but when it doesn't, it just means requiring more food to survive. Consequently, around 2.6 million years ago, 
the last of the megalodons disappeared from the fossil record. However, like the disappearance of whales left a lasting mark on the megalodon, its own disappearance left an even more lasting mark on all marine life. These are changes that we are still experiencing today as part of Megalodon's legacy. In order to understand this, we got to trace our steps back to the time the shark went extinct. As a result, in the last couple of million years, great white sharks and orcas took over the role of apex predators. However, these much smaller predators couldn't hunt the larger whales that Megalodon could eat. Modern great white sharks often prey on dolphins half their size, so it's possible that the 18-meter Megalodon was able to hunt whales up to 9 meters long, which was simply too large for other predators to handle. Consequently, after the Megalodon went extinct, the size of whales dramatically increased. During the Pleistocene, the oceans became colder and productivity at the poles improved, leading to a resurgence of diatoms. This new, productive environment, combined with the absence of large predators, allowed whales to grow to sizes twice as large as the biggest whales of the Pliocene. This is why the blue whale, the largest animal ever, appeared in the fossil record less than 2 million years ago. Without 18-meter sharks like Megalodon, the oceans could support 25-meter whales. The Megalodon and its ancestors had a successful run thriving for over 20 million years by evolving to eat larger marine mammals. However, as those large mammals began to decline and competition with other predators like great white sharks increased, the megalodon could not keep up. It's interesting to note that the largest great white sharks today are about a meter longer than their Miocene ancestors and grow faster while they are young, much like megalodon did. It took nearly 30 million years for the megatoothed sharks to evolve into the enormous megalodon, a transformation driven by the gradual increase in the size of whales and other marine mammals. Today, whales are already huge and face very few predators, leaving the role of a super shark open. Who knows, the great white shark could very well evolve into the megalodon of the future, and giant sharks might once again patrol our oceans. What happens when turtles grow to the size of rhinos? This is the tale of the biggest sea turtle to ever exist. As massive as up to three young humans standing on top of each other in length, this beast had a life you'll want to hear about. Archelon lived in the late Cretaceous period, approximately 100 to 66 million years ago. Its name originates from the ancient Greek words aki, meaning first, and kon, meaning turtle. Its scientific name, Archelon Iskyrus, straight up represents its immense size and power. But what makes this guy really stand out is the fact that it is recognized as the largest turtle species ever documented. Its most substantial specimen measures a remarkable 15 feet, or 4.5 meters, from head to tail, and weighs up to 3.2 tons, or 7,054 pounds. Fossils of Archelon have been exclusively discovered within the Pier Shale Formation in North America. This geographical find tells us a lot about the prehistoric marine ecosystems of that era, like the diversity and dynamics of ancient sea life. But we'll get into its discovery in more detail later. First, we have got to talk about what it really looked like. This massive turtle had a unique hooked beak and powerful jaws perfect for crushing hard-shelled critters like crustaceans and mollusks as it lazily drifted through the ocean. But what might surprise you is that it did not have a very hard shell like other turtles. The main reason for this was its sheer size. A solid shell at that size would have made the Archelon sink like a rock. So, to counter this, it had dense rib bones and a lighter covering, which provided enough buoyancy to prevent sinking, while still allowing control while swimming. The shell would have also had ridges running down its back, adding to its protection against larger predators like mosasaurs. We'll talk about its shell in more detail later in the video. Now, despite its size, the Archelon may have still been vulnerable to attacks, especially targeting its delicate flippers. But there would have been easier prey options for predators, making direct attacks on the Archelon less common. Apart from all these unique features, Archelon also had incredibly long flippers, and yet it's believed they weren't the strongest swimmers. Analysis of their structure suggests they may have been more suited to calmer, shallower waters. However, evidence suggests that it could have managed short bursts of speed, 
possibly allowing it to catch moving prey or even travel in the open ocean if necessary. Coming to its skull, it was as massive as the turtle itself, measuring up to 3.3 feet long or 100 centimeters. To put it into perspective, that's the size of an adult penguin. It had a long and narrow head with a beak that looked like it belonged to a bird of prey, but with a double-edged twist. The nostrils were elongated and pointed forward, making it stand out even more from other turtles. But perhaps the most interesting feature was Archelon's jaw. When it came to eating, its jaw worked like a hammer thanks to the articular bone, which was probably cushioned by cartilage. This allowed it to chomp down on its prey with ease. Speaking of prey, let's talk about what this turtle liked to feast on. Archelon was all about the meat. It was a carnivore through and through. Its thick lower shell suggests it spent a lot of time chilling on soft, muddy seabeds, probably munching on slow-moving snacks like big mollusks and crustaceans. Back in the day, there were plenty of giant, thin-shelled bivalves around, perfect for Archelon's dinner table. But as time went on, these snacks became scarce in its habitat, but it still had a pretty diverse diet, much like some modern turtles. It feasted on soft-bodied cephalopods like jellyfish and squid, suggesting it had varied predatory habits. With its jaws built for crushing, Archelon likely enjoyed munching on large crabs and mollusks too. The waters it inhabited were rich in thin-shelled shellfish, some as big as four feet in diameter, which would have provided ample sustenance. But Archelon might have also surfaced occasionally to forage for food. Apart from that, near where Archelon lived, there were lots of Neosaurus teeth lying around, hinting that they might have been on its menu too. And just like other sea turtles, Archelon probably hit the beach to lay its eggs. It would have dug a hole in the sand popped in a bunch of eggs and then left them to hatch on their own. No parenting for this big guy. We'll discuss how they reproduced later in the video. Young Archelons probably didn't hang around the coasts much, not even during breeding season. The largest Archelon, named Brigetta, is estimated to have lived up to a hundred years old. It might have made its end while partially buried in mud in a state called brumation, kind of like hibernation but underwater. There's been a long-held belief that marine turtles, including Archelons, brumate underwater, just like freshwater turtles. But, considering how often they had to come up for air to avoid drowning, that might not be quite right. As for where it lived, fossils found in states like Wyoming and North Dakota, specifically within the Pierre Shale Formation, give us clues about Archelon's habitat preferences during the late Cretaceous period. This giant turtle likely favored shallow sea environments, as indicated by these discoveries. Its ability to generate powerful strokes suggests it was well equipped for cross-ocean migrations and could quickly get away from other aquatic predators if needed. Its preferred place to live was the northern region of the Western Interior Seaway, which has warm to mild temperatures. This area was dominated by plesiosaurs, which really tell you about the diverse and competitive ecosystem in which this creature thrived. It was a muddy, oxygen-depleted habitat with an average depth of possibly slightly more than 600 feet or 182 meters. The water in this environment likely had a typical temperature of around 63 degrees Fahrenheit or 17 degrees Celsius. This raises the question of how Archelon reproduced in such an environment. The simple answer is, it didn't. Archelon, much like present-day turtles, came ashore to lay eggs and that's probably the only time it made its way to the shore. Once laid, these eggs would hatch, and the young turtles would have to navigate through predators to reach the safety of the ocean. With the exception of a few species, most modern turtles follow a consistent nesting behavior of excavating nests to lay their eggs. They typically create chambers in the sand or soil where they deposit their eggs. The female turtle initiates this process by using alternating scooping motions of her back legs to dig the nesting chamber after finding a suitable nesting spot. This nesting behavior is believed to have originated from Archelon. While it may have escaped the water to lay eggs, it still had to head back in there for survival. And that's where trouble was sometimes waiting for it. Archelon was massive, but natural predators like Mosasaurs, Allosaurus, and possibly even sharks like Cretoxyrena were a major threat to it. It was a giant, but predators could still target vulnerable areas like its flippers. However, the sheer size of the Archelon shell might have provided some protection against certain predators. 
at the very least, adult male archelons, with their large size and sturdy bodies, would have been more challenging for predators to catch compared to other sea reptiles with slimmer frames. These guys likely used their hardened underside plates as a form of defense. Evidence from bite marks found near fossils also suggests that they may have been targeted by blind predator attacks. So, let's look into their armor and what it does for them in these situations. Archelon's carapace, the protective shell covering its back, consisted of eight neural plates on each side, nearest to the midline, and nine neural plates connecting the midline to the ribs. These plates were mostly uniform in size, except for two pairs. The plates corresponding to the eight thoracic vertebrae were smaller, while the plate nearest to the tail was larger. Unlike other sea turtles, Archelon had ten pairs of ribs, and also unlike other sea turtles, where the first rib meets the first pleural plate, Archelon's first rib was noticeably shorter than the second, covering only about three quarters of the length. The second to fifth ribs projected at right angles from the midline and measured an impressive 3.3 feet or 100 centimeters in length each in the hollow type specimen. Its ribs increased in thickness vertically as they moved away from the midline. They were relatively larger and more well-developed than those of sea turtles, originating with a thickness of 0.98 inches or 2.5 centimeters and ending with around 1.6 to 2 inches or 4 to 5 centimeters. The carapace likely featured a row of ridges along the midline over the chest region, possibly totaling seven ridges, each peaking at one or two inches or 2.5 or 5 centimeters. Without a firmly jointed neck and pleural plates, the skin over the carapace was probably thick, strong, and leathery, providing support for the shoulder girdle. Archelon also had osteoclerotic structures, dense and heavy bone formations that likely served as ballasts in life, similar to the limb bones of whales and other deep sea animals. Now that we've talked about its shell in detail, it brings up the question, how did this turtle end up developing that massive carapace? Well, the truth is, the mystery of how the turtle acquired its iconic shell remained a hot topic for over 120 years, until 2008, when a groundbreaking discovery shed light on the matter. A unique 1.3 feet or 40 centimeter fossil found in China unveiled a reptile resembling a turtle, but with only half of its shell intact. This species, named Odontochelus semitstasia, meaning toothed turtle with half a shell, sported a hard shell on its underside, similar to the plastron of modern turtles, but lacked the upper part or carapace. Remarkably, Odontochelus had enlarged ribs, indicating that the bottom part of the turtle shell evolved before the top. Since the fossil was unearthed in marine deposits, one hypothesis suggests that the evolution of the plastron served as a defense mechanism against predators, providing early turtles with protection from threats in their aquatic environment. Coming from beneath in a marine environment, the remarkable fossil of Odontochelus predates Proganochelus by roughly 10 million years, pushing back the origin of turtles to about 220 million years ago. In 2015, another big discovery further enhanced our understanding of the connection between turtles and other reptiles. Papakilis rosi, the grandfather turtle, is a small reptile measuring about 0.6 feet or 20 centimeters, but it boasted significantly enlarged and flattened ribs, distinguishing it from other fossil turtles. Unlike other turtles, Papakilis lacked a shell, indicating it likely represents a transitional form between lizard-like reptiles and turtles, often referred to as a missing link. Papakilis shares similarities with other lizards, such as Unotosaurus africanus, featuring enlarged T-shaped ribs, elongated vertebrae, and a generally round body shape. Both species were terrestrial animals capable of digging. Unotosaurus was first thought to be a turtle ancestor way back in 1892. Nowadays, scientists believe the big ribs on Unotosaurus and Papakilis were more about stability for digging than anything else. They reckon Unotosaurus already had the same breathing setup as turtles, thanks to their sturdy rib cages. Plus, Papakilis' skull looks a lot like other reptiles, showing turtles are probably closer kin to modern lizards and snakes than other extinct reptiles. This idea is now widely accepted among researchers. Later on, after the Triassic period, turtles split into two main groups, the Pleurodires and the Cryptodires. Initially, neither group had the neck retraction mechanisms that are now their most obvious feature, Pleurodires, or side neck turtles, later folded their necks to the side of their shells. 
while cryptodires, or hidden neck turtles, pulled their heads back and up into their shells. Both of these methods required complex changes to their neck bones and muscles. Today's turtles are either pleurodires or cryptodires. During the Triassic period, turtles protected their necks in various ways. For example, Proganochelus had a collar of horny spikes, while Paleocaris, another late Triassic turtle, had an extension of the carapace. Pleurodires are now less common, mostly found in the southern hemisphere, but they were once widespread both on land and in the waters around the coasts. Sea turtles and soft-shelled turtles, both cryptodires, are found worldwide. Santanachelus, a cryptodira from the early Cretaceous, had large salt glands under its eyes, essential for excreting excess salt from its seafood diet. In earlier times, turtles had movable metacarpal and short digits on their feet, similar to land turtles. Later on, these toe bones lengthened and became encased in flesh, and the feet evolved into flippers as sea turtle diversity exploded during the Cretaceous period. Some cryptodires even began an evolutionary journey back to land. Modern tortoises are descendants of sea-dwelling turtles, not directly from older land turtles. The specific changes involved in this transition aren't well documented, but many turtles returned to being toe walkers, and their shell ornamentation and shape varied greatly over time. Coming back to the Archelon, its impressive size and unique adaptations, such as its star-shaped plates for achieving neutral buoyancy, hold great evolutionary significance. These traits not only helped this creature thrive in the varied marine environments of the late Cretaceous period, but also offer valuable insights into the evolutionary transition from ancient creatures to modern sea turtles like the leatherback. Studying its features provides us with a window into the past, shedding light on the evolutionary processes that have shaped the development of sea turtles over millions of years. But how was this beast of a turtle first discovered? The Archelon sea turtle was first unearthed by American paleontologist George Reba Wieland in 1895. He stumbled upon the holotype specimen the very first fossil of its kind within the Pierce Shale Geological Formation in South Dakota. Wieland made this remarkable discovery along the shores of the Cheyenne River in Custer County. Interestingly, the specimen he found lacked its skull. But in 1897, another individual stumbled upon a fossilized skull of the turtle in the same area. Then, in 1902, yet another complete specimen was uncovered along the Cheyenne River. In more recent times, Significant discoveries of Archelon skeletons have taken place in South Dakota in 1992 and North Dakota in 2002. The 1992 find was particularly notable as it yielded the largest specimen known at the time. This specimen, affectionately named Brigitte, was discovered in Oglala, Lakota County, South Dakota and is currently on display at the Vienna Natural History Museum. All in all, these discoveries have greatly enriched our understanding of Archelon and its prehistoric environment. Of course, scientists have been able to classify this beast based on the fossils too. It is classified within the reptile class Reptilia, the order Testandines, the suborder Cryptodira, and the extinct family Protostegidae. And while it may resemble other sea turtles, Archelon doesn't share ancestry with any living or extinct species. In fact, its evolutionary path within the Protostegidae family is pretty unique, setting it apart from other sea turtles. As to what caused its extinction, it's speculated that as the seaway gradually moved southward, Archelon may have struggled to migrate along with it. And so, the increasing presence of new marine or mammalian species posing a threat to its eggs and hatchlings could have contributed to its extinction. The disappearance of giant protostegids coincides with the rise of democolids, suggesting a shift in the marine ecosystem. Protostegids, including Archelon, are notably absent in Maastrichtian deposits the latest Cretaceous period, likely due to a cooling trend. This cooling may have affected other turtles as well, but some species managed to survive thanks to their thermoregulatory capabilities. It's estimated that average water temperatures dropped to around 45 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit, or 7 to 12 degrees centigrade, depending on CO2 levels. However, there is some evidence suggesting that Archelon might have persisted into the Maastrichtian period. Fossils from the Maastrichtian age Kansas Pierre shale deposits could indicate that Archelon survived longer than previously thought, possibly enduring millions of years into the Maastrichtian era. In the end, only one thing remains to be said. Archelon stands as a majestic symbol of the prehistoric world. It offers a peek into a bygone era when giants roamed the seas. 
Its colossal size, reaching up to 15 feet in length, truly makes it the king of the turtles. With its leathery shell and powerful jaws, Archelon likely navigated the depths of the late Cretaceous waters in search of prey. All of its fossils that have been recently pulled out give us remarkable insights into the prehistoric marine ecosystem. It's quite amazing how despite being beyond huge, this turtle was still not invincible in the scary waters of South Dakota. It faced challenges from predators like mosasaurs and sharks. Yet, its resilience and evolutionary adaptations tell you about the incredible diversity and survival strategies of ancient marine life. Today, Archelon's fossils serve as invaluable treasures, offering clues to understanding the mysteries of our planet's distant past. As we continue to explore and uncover the secrets of our natural world, Archelon will forever be the most amazing turtle that once lived beneath the waves. Meet the T-Rex of the sea, the mighty Mosasaurs. These were fascinating aquatic lizards that lived during the Cretaceous period, spanning from 145.5 million to 66 million years ago. They grew to colossal sizes, and I mean as big as 17 meters. Yeah, that's bigger than three SUVs parked together. Think of a swimming Komodo dragon, but like whale-sized. These mosasaurs had a tapered snout, rough skin, and instead of regular limbs, they had four fins and their tail looked exactly like a shark's tail, but flipped upside down. What's even more interesting is that these creatures didn't start off as massive. In fact, many scientists think they came from a family of semi-aquatic lizards called the Agilosaurus, which popped up around 99 million years ago in Europe. They were mostly present in the shallow waters of the prehistoric Tethys Ocean, spending most of their time on land, unlike their later descendants. Back then, these early mosasaurs were pretty small, only a few feet or meters long, and they snacked on small fish, lizards, maybe even amphibians, which is honestly a far cry from the epic diets of their later cousins. But over millions of years, they evolved and grew into the legendary rulers of the Cretaceous Seas. For millions of years, the Agilosaurus, known as the Agilosauridae, remained unchanged. However, they did face tough competition from two dominant forces in the water, the short-necked Plesiosaurs and the dolphin-like Ichthyosaurs. These two groups made the top of the food chain highly competitive, leaving little room for newcomers. Yet, around 90 million years ago, both Plesiosaurs and Ichthyosaurs went extinct, and that's what created an opening for the Agilosauridae. Now, one thing about these guys is that they were pro at ambush hunting. In fact, these bad boys could go from still to crazy fast in the blink of an eye, kind of like modern crocs when they get that burst of power. You've probably seen how fish bend into a sea shape and push off the water to get a fast start. Well, mosasaurs probably did something similar, but on a much bigger scale. They could cover 75% of its body length in just one second, so technically, if it was 17 meters away from you, it could get 75% closer in just one second. And in the next second, it could pass you and possibly have eaten you for dinner. Also, being hit by a mosasaur would be like getting smacked by a semi-truck. The impact alone could kill prey instantly, not to mention the biting part. These sea monsters could hit 30 miles an hour in just one second, making them the ultimate marine predators in history. Mosasaurs, based on their bones, are confirmed as reptiles. However, a significant discovery in South Dakota sheds light on their reproductive habits. A Pleoplatocarpus, often referred to as a mother mosasaur, was found with the remains of several unborn young in her abdomen. This finding strongly suggests that mosasaurs gave birth to live offspring, similar to ichthyosaurs. Unlike other reptiles, such as crocodiles, alligators, and turtles, which lay numerous small eggs, mosasaurs likely had a small brood, typically no more than four or five babies at a time. The mosasaurs were pretty dark in color, and there's a good reason behind that. The predominantly dark body of this massive creature played a crucial role in efficient heat regulation and served as camouflage against intense UV radiation. Researchers discovered this through the study of fossilized skin pigments from an 85 million year old mosasaur, highlighting the importance of its unique dark coloration for thriving in the Cretaceous seas. Mosasaurs went through some major changes over time. Their hands and feet turned into flippers, and their tails became powerful tools for swimming. The most significant transformation was their size. 
they became so huge that it was more likely than not for a new mosasaur to be over 12 feet or 4 meters long. Some even reached massive sizes, like the world record holder, Bruce, a Tylosaurus, believed to be 43 feet long. In just 25 million years, these changes allowed mosasaurs to become the top marine predators, which is a surprisingly short time compared to other marine reptiles. They quickly diversified, with 42 members having a strong presence worldwide. But it wasn't just their size that made them successful. Mosasaurs varied widely in size, with the smallest being only 3.3 feet long. This range let them adapt to various environments, including freshwater habitats. There's another pretty cool fact about these huge, powerful marine creatures. Even though mosasaurs lived in water, being reptiles meant they had to come up for air, just like sea turtles do today. They were also non-stop swimmers, always diving for prey and coming up for air, just like us. Yep, they'd pop up to the surface, take a breath, and dive right back in. Scientists tested this in New Jersey and Alabama and found that around 3 to 17% of their vertebrae showed signs of damage from decompression. That's because they'd go up and down repeatedly. Moreover, this badass creature didn't just stick to one type of water. In fact, the first fossils of the Mosasaur were discovered in a museum, and they named it after a river flowing through France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Later, more species were also found in the Midwestern United States, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and even Hungary. This just goes to show how versatile this creature was. It wasn't just limited to freshwater, it also made appearances in cold Antarctica. And there are probably a lot more of these guys waiting to be discovered, maybe even near your city. Now across the Mosasaur family, their teeth varied and were highly specialized with curved teeth that point backward to the throat and an additional set on the roof of the mouth. Any venture into this seagoing lizard's mouth was undoubtedly a one-way trip. The question that follows such a scary bite is, what did the Mosasaurus actually eat? Thanks to a cool find in Canada in 2008, we got some clues. Workers found the bones of a Mosasaurus. The paleontologists uncovered not just the lizard, but also its last meal. They found fish bones in its gut and under its skeleton, belonging to a three-foot-long fish. What's exciting is that some of the fish bones had bite marks, and their positions hinted that the fish was the Mosasaur's final snack. This is the first time they found such remains inside the Mosasaurus itself. The way the fish bones look suggests a bit of a wild ending. Even though the Mosasaur's head was smaller than the fish, it probably could have swallowed it whole. But the scattered bones tell a different story. The Mosasaur might have caught the fish and tore it into pieces before munching down each part. Another cool feature Mosasaurs had was their jaws. Well, to be fair, it was more handy than cool. They had double-hinged, super-flexible jaws that let them swallow prey almost whole, kind of like snakes. There were two sets of teeth in their upper jaws. The second set, smaller and positioned farther back, helped them grip onto struggling prey while swallowing it whole. Some Mosasaurs even had specially adapted jaws, or rather snouts like Tylosaurus. With all these new evolutionary traits that started from a basic aquatic lizard, these guys became unstoppable, and by the end of the Cretaceous period, their impact was so huge that when a new member entered a new environment, it often led to a complete overhaul in the local fauna. For a good 20 million years, the Mosasaurs ruled the seas and oceans, and it seems like they were just getting stronger with time. In their final days, some of the biggest members, like the Mosasaurus, Tylosaurus, and Prognathodon coexisted, making life tough for other ocean dwellers. Interestingly, during this time, they were even more numerous and widespread than the mighty T-Rex. But just when things seemed perfect, their reign came crashing down. It's kind of ironic, really. The same things that helped them to rise to power ended up being their downfall. Remember how extinction events once cleared the way for them? Well, this time, they wiped out many Mosasaurs, and the survivors couldn't escape its effects. Since then, no Mosasaur fossils have been found past the Cretaceous boundary, marking the end of their era. Also, the same big size that made some Mosasaurs top predators became a problem. Their massive bodies turned out to be a challenge during the extinction events, 
bigger animals struggled more, and none over 55 pounds or 25 kilograms made it through. Sadly, none of the living mosasaurs at the time were even close to that weight. So, their sudden fame ended as suddenly as it began. In the end, mosasaur were the biggest marine reptiles around, with jaws that nightmares are made of. They truly dominated the sea, and with their incredible speeds, you bet no other creature dared to mess with them. And that's a wrap. What surprised you the most about this amazing, gigantic lizard? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past.